Welcome to the Theory of DFS podcast. I'm Jordan Cooper, uh, the co-author of the Theory of Daily Fantasy Sports, 15-hour audio DFS masterclass at theoryofdfs.com. Two weeks in a row, Eric didn't quit immediately. <laughs> Just like, I'm back and I'm not back anymore. No, no, you're back. And uh, and yesterday, uh, you p- punched your ticket into another... Uh, you didn't get you didn't get in basketball this past season, but you got mm-hmm. you got into baseball early, uh, and 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 you you've been saying a lot of stuff. I I want to I want to talk about about MLB this episode because yeah. I think uh, both of us are uh, changing our approach on how we play MLB DF, DFS GPPs, uh, and you've been talking about it a lot on the Four Factors blog on on mm-hmm. Roto Grinders. And if you notice that uh, it's six weeks into the season, and you don't you don't hear me much talk about vomit stacks anymore, right? <laughs> yeah. Like you do, like yep. like I was the king of double stud pitcher jamming the tigers because that's the only way you could get both stud pitchers, and let's hope the pirates put up eight runs today type of thing. And I've actually been playing more lineups that are kind of the reverse of that. And I get a feeling that you're doing similar when it comes to that, primarily due on DraftKings. Yep. Primarily due to uh, DraftKings pricing is nowhere near as sharp as it used to be. Yeah, it's maybe it'll get better. Um, I feel like we go through a little bit of this roller coaster with with pricing every year. Last. You know, I guess we can kind of throw out last year, but I feel like this happens where everybody's complaining about this goddamn pricing. Like, why are there so many 2K hitters? And why is Garrett Cole, 80, like in the qualifier that I was in last, he was 84%, you know, and Jacob deGrom is not, it, you know, he's hurt now, but he was like 90 plus percent. He, yeah, but I mean, Garrett, Garrett Cole was 84% on a slate where we had Darvish and yeah. Bueller. Right, right. So it's a, it's, it's, a couple of different things, I think, but to your point, the the main takeaway for me so far that I've definitely had to adjust to is this concept that I bring up almost every day. Everyone subscribes to I'm paying for pitching, I'm playing the chalk pitching that's the the you know quote unquote best, right? The best projection play. I'm I'm playing them and it does I, I don't really I don't really care. I'm playing 85% owned Garrett Cole. And I'll get different elsewhere, right? Which they don't ever end up actually. No one, like when you play Garrett Cole and you Darvish together, there's only so many combinations of hitters you can play that aren't just total dog shit. So Taylor Ward, right? And I mean, I would probably argue that Taylor Ward is dog shit, but you get Taylor Ward, right? At like 50% ownership. As Andrew a, as a hitter. Vaughn, Jared yep. Kellenick, but yep. only, only, but I, I, I think the reason this is happening, the two reasons this is happening. First off, the, I mean, it's it's correct that high price pitching is the least variant in baseball. And baseball in and of itself is a high variant sport. But the salary floors on DraftKings make it so that like every team mostly has some hitter that sh- that should really be thirty five hundred, that's priced at twenty four hundred. That allows yep. you to even make the four, four or five man stack of nearly any team. If you want to stack the Red Sox, and it's like, oh well, Devers is expensive, and Martinez is expensive, and Bogarts is expensive. Well, here's Michael Chavis twenty five hundred. Here's yep. here's uh, here's Hunter Renfro twenty eight hundred. Like. Yesterday, yesterday with the White Sox. So I played the White Sox, but the White Sox are who you needed to to win tournaments. Andrew, like you said, Tim Anderson is expensive, whatever. Moncada and the catchers are expensive. Here's Nick Madrigal hitting second at 3K, and here's Andrew Vaughn at 2,500 or or whatever he was. So when you have the instance where you have high projected one-offs, like we have guys that are 2,400, that really should be 3,600. Like, from a median projection standpoint, like, they will be jammed in as one-offs. The stack, the high team total stack will be put in, and you're still able to afford. Like, we don't have pitchers that are 12K. These are still 10K pitchers 
that from a median perspective, these are the these are the best lineups. Like it's yep. it's not it's not the type of thing where you could you have to lower your projection threshold. So like when I used to do vomit stacks, like the stack that I'm picking, the five man stack is legitimately ten to fifteen points lower. It it drops my lineup's projection down, but I'm relying on the fact that I'm going to get two ceilings out of my pitchers and two pitchers that the only way to play those two pitchers is by playing the vomit stack. So if you're going to get 35 to 40 points out of each pitcher, people will be like, most lineups will be, well, as long as you have one of them, like (laughs) you're fine because you how, how you play both of them. Well, I played both of them and the pirates put up 10 runs and it's like there, bink, done Marlins, Tigers, those types of teams. But now we're, we're, we have the pricing on DraftKings where that's, that is, that is the, like, you don't even, that I try to stack Eric. I try to do the vomit stack and go, okay, let me, let me stack like yesterday, the Tigers against Kikuchi because Kikuchi was going to be the chalk SB2. Mm-hmm. Okay, now they had three catchers in their lineup, which is stupid, right? <laughs> right. That, that that was that was a whole different different thing, right? Because they're trying to get right-handed hitters in their lineup. I'm trying to build this. I'm trying to build ju- just a five X, a five man Tiger stack, three one offs, two pitchers. Now I'm assuming, obviously, since I'm playing the Tigers, my one offs are going to be like Acuna. Baez, it's going to be expensive one-offs because I have the salary. And then I put in Cole and Darvish together. I'm doing that. It can't even spend the money. It can't, yep. like, the, the problem comes in is that this lineup, if anyone put in a five-man Tiger stack, the amount of combinations of five-man Tiger stacks is so limited unless you lower your salary floor. So yes, mm-hmm. there may be, you have Trout, you have Acuna, you have Soto, you have guys up there. But remember, you're jamming in the two highest rejected pitchers, Cole and Darvish, 64, in the large GPP on DraftKings, 64% and like 40-something percent owned. <laughs> uh, yes, the Tigers stack is low owned, but your one-offs are, it's Contreras, it's uh, Mercedes, it's it's yep. three high-priced guys that if you're going to build a stack that cheap, there's only so many guys, unless you set your floor past like 49K and lower, those one-offs, like how many combinations, if that's the winning stack? Yes, the stack is only 1% owned. But we're talking about a contest with 70,000 entries in it. So there's 700 Tiger stacks. There aren't 700 combinations of that, of, of, yeah. I would, and then if I don't play the two chalk pitchers, what am I going to go down? I'm going to play what? I'm going to go down and play Max Freed, and then leave six thousand on the table. Like, <laughs> like the problem comes in is that, and then when you do that, the projection t- takes a tank, and you're looking and you're like, okay, I got the leverage, but now my projection is forty points below everyone else's, and I'm leaving seven thousand on the table in order to be different with my already one percent owned stack. Because there just aren't enough combos. I think people don't get that that 100%. combinatronics of it. It's like yep. I'm not viewing the Tiger stack as one percent times one percent times one percent times one. No, all five I count as one ownership. So mm-hmm. it's just one one percent owned five man block. The amount of combinations that could be made about that because the pricing is so soft makes it that most lineups with Tigers have Cole Darvish have Soto, Acuna, Trout in it, right? Like they, yep. the, the Tiger stack has a cheap scope. First base is taken taken away. You're probably playing two outfielders. You One of the catchers, you're like, uh, in that in their lineup, probably a second baseman was empty. So whoever the highest price second baseman in is actually going to be more correlated with the Tiger stack <laughs> than anyone else in the lineup. Yep. So you take a look at those things and you go, I don't mind playing these types of lineups when the pitcher combination isn't able to be used as often and that the, that the stack is is not so cheap that the rest of the lineup, ha- I mean, anyone that plugs in an optimizer, if they went in to lineup HQ and put 5X and says, 
Give me 5% of my 100 lineups. Tiger stacks. Five lineups. Like, most likely, no matter what projection system you're on, it's just going to want to jam in raw points and all the other slots. Yep. And <clears throat> you're sitting there going, I hope the Tigers win. And then it's realized that you're, you're, you're a 1v1 or even duped with other Tiger stacks. And they're yeah. the 1% don't stack. Yet, if, all, if, if you switch your pitching combination... You you eliminate so many combinations that you're now so far you're, you're only a you're a one v you're a two v two difference yet you're yet the amount of leverage you get is dramatic it looks like you're playing it's an eight it's a two v two of a ten man lineup yet you have so much more leverage than some other lineups that are three v threes and four v fours because once you go from Cole to Bueller. Like do you you just you eliminated like out of those seven hundred tigers combinations like half of them at least sixty yep. percent of them and now let's say you uh you don't play the tiger stack you now you now you're playing a slightly more expensive stack and now you're 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 playing darvish you're not playing cole and you're playing darvish plus kikuchi which is not like like it's not like that was contrarian but yeah. you're lim- like the pitching ownership is so condensed. <clears throat> That even though like the vomit stack relies on two stud pitchers, when two stud pitchers is is the chalk, like it just like you might as well just take your vomit stacks and just throw them out the window. Like I, I don't even I don't even do that anymore. So like I f- I find now the expensive stacks yep. are the ones that go under owned. The, the, the stacks that have ceilings but don't have good point per dollar value. Number one. Because you have to get uncomfortable at pitcher, and people don't like getting uncomfortable at pitcher. And number two is that uh, optimizers won't won't build those. Like you have nope. to you have to you have to tell it to build expensive Dodger stacks. You have to tell it expensive st- Cub stacks when they're overpriced. Like they still have a ceiling though. You have to yep. tell it to do it. It's going to want to jam in you know, uh, these two stud pitcher types of combinations, especially with these one-off Taylor Wards and Kellenix and whoever's at the bottom. But the problem comes in is that you have to be uncomfortable at pitcher. And like yesterday, like people must have thought it nuts that in 10% of my lineups, I'm playing Jordan Lyles against the New York Yankees. Yep. Because I'm going, people are going to play the Yankees because people like picking on Jordan Lyles. He's 5,400 and no one is paying down at pitcher today. It's like this is how I this is how I build my Dodgers Braves lineup. Yeah, that's like a five three with no cheap hitters, and it's like I'm not overlapped at all. Now, obviously, uh, it's less likely to get there from a point per dollar perspective, but I find that there's so much more leverage available that way. But it relies, Eric, on what you've been saying at pitching is that the pitching has gotten so condensed that that the leverage you could get just by not by going nuts at pitcher. Yeah, Jordan Lyles may be a little nuts. It may, it may be <laughs> nuts. Because uh, I wasn't playing much Yankees. So it's the type of thing where if I'm not playing many Yankees lineups, who's correlated with the Yankees doing poorly? Well, yep. Lyles actually doing decently and he was cheap enough. That, it's not like it was 8,000. It was 5,400. Uh, the, the, what comes in now is that uh, at, you don't have to get weird anymore. Like at the bats, no. like you said, like you played the White Sox and they were on DraftKings. They were the chalkiest stack. But as long as you didn't play Cole Darvish as a combo and didn't play like a like a Kellenic or Ward one-off in that lineup, you're playing the chalk stack and you're good. Yep. I made one <clears throat> one little uh, you know deviation from within the White Sox and I just played Grandal over Mercedes, which ended up... Which ended up not working because he hit a goddamn home run off of Astadio in the three o two. That was that was brutal. was that but the anyway. heaviest? Was that the heaviest home run ever? <laughs> gotta be, gotta be three hundred pounds against three fifty or whatever. And they're both short. It's the girthiest. That's what it was. That was the girthiest home run. You know, five foot eight, two hundred and seventy pounds, and five foot nine, three hundred. That was a that was a matchup. And the other idiot White Sox, like Andrew Andrew Vaughn, <laughs> I, I could have 
swung as well as I don't know what he was doing. It was embarrassing. It was so tilting too because I didn't need the only thing I didn't need to like I would have cruised to the to the qualifier and probably had a really nice night. The only thing is Mercedes not to hit home run. So of course he does. But anyway, I'm I'm not complaining obviously. But one little thing, right? I knew Mercedes was going to be higher owned than. Then Grandal, the White Sox did come in even higher than like right. Than, they than came I thought in I way higher than even I way, expected. Right? I'm like way, they're going to be one higher. of the more owned stacks, but yeah. maybe not super owned. And then as I'm looking, yeah. I'm like, why? Why are they this owned? Yeah, I, I I was I was pretty surprised. So that was actually kind of frustrating, but you know it is what it is. But so I did think about that. Like, okay, if I just make a t- like, I'm like Mercedes is definitely going to be much higher on the Grandal. Nobody's paying five k for for Grandal hitting lower. Blah blah blah. Um, everybody loves Mercedes. So I made a, a little slight deviation from within there. And then I played Matt. We talked about Matt, Max Reed. I made a slight deviation, right? I'm, I just, I'm fading Cole. That was my decision. I'm like, Cole is going to be a million percent. I'm fading him. So in that case, I don't really care about, yeah, that, that White Sox ownership, which I said came in way higher than I thought. And I don't really care about Darvish because I'm also playing Max Freed as kind of a pivot off of Kikuchi. I wasn't, you know, I knew Kikuchi would be much higher owned than Freed. I wasn't sure exactly what ownership Kikuchi would get because of what you talked about with the double studs, everybody just playing double stud. But I knew Freed was completely unowned. Um, and so it was like, I just did like two little things and then like played like what fit, <laughs> right? Like somebody asked me like, why did you play the Nats? I'm like, uh, they're three, they're a three man. That's pretty good hitters. And they fit with, <laughs> with, I needed a first, I needed a first baseman. Soto's pretty good. Schwarber's pretty good. Right. You know, you played, though, I Josh that, Bell, right. And yeah, yeah. Josh Bell. Yeah, it's like they they fit. They fit. They not only do they fit. You know, I like to play five a five man with a, with another three three man stack. Um, and not a hundred percent. That that's my preference though. And so I'm looking for that. Um, so not only do they fit like the salary tier, they fit like Soto was going to be completely unowned with with uh, like Otani and Trout and such and such on the slate. So it just fit all of the dynamics of exactly what I was trying to do, and I didn't care that much about anything other than does this fit you know my okay i'm not playing cole and now can i make this can i make this work with the white Sox? so anyway the funniest thing that i saw uh maybe in the last week or so was justin mcmahon i think it's the mcmahon is how you say it from daily fantasy insider tweeted that uh it was like middle of the day the cubs were facing god i can't remember who it was some garbage lefty tigers garbage lefty and they're like all 6,000. And it was on another one of these slates with these expensive pitchers, right? You had multiple 10K pitchers. That's what everybody was doing. Right. That, that, I think and they were facing Scooble, right? Scooble. Yeah. Right. Because yep. I remember because I stacked because I, I stacked them because they were so expensive and no one was going to is like Baez is like the most expensive hitter. Like at the Bryant's like 62. I'm like, well, you're like, says Nico Horner up to 5K <laughs> for no reason. <laughs> Nico Horner hadn't played in like a week. He hits ninth for the Cubs, and he was like the most expensive second baseman by a lot. It was so 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 bizarre. And so he tweets that. So I had been looking to try to stack the Cubs for every reason, like we have just been talking about here. Um, and he tweets, you know, someone else in the industry is like, "What the hell is DraftKings doing? They made it literally impossible to play the Cubs." And so I read that, and I'm like, "Well, of course I'm fucking stacking the Cubs now." Right. I'm like, I, "I will, I will make, I will make this work because I know that none of like I will literally have the only Cubs stack, like in, right. in the, your con- in, in your East, contest especially." The and I had the they were all basically only ones were were now it, it didn't it didn't work they they did okay they, they did okay that the five man yeah. didn't work out that's like yeah ex- ex- exactly but I had to play it was uh, the Rockies were playing the Reds in Coors Field Herman Marquez who also is like what kind of one of my, my favorite pitchers to play in TFS because he's actually pretty good and he's always cheap because he's in cores and people just stack against him because he's in cores. And so I play him and it was like the perfect thing. But yeah, he scored like 20 points. And another cheap pitcher did, I can't remember who it was, did pretty well. Uh, uh, Griffin Canning, same thing. There was like these cheap pitchers and they actually like, they did their part. They like, they came in pretty darn close to the expensive pitchers. I think they were like, 6100 and like 5600 or so or something ab- absurd that I spent on pitching to be able to fit, to fit these five cubs that cost like $35,000 or whatever, you know. But to your point, it's like I'm also not h- how I'm approaching it. I'm not even like betting on like this team, right? That's what people think about. Like, oh, I like that this stacks win probability is is like yes, kind of I am, 
clearly the Cubs are a good stack. They wouldn't be all 6,000 against Tariq Skubal if, if they weren't a, a good stack. But I'm not even like as much betting on that as I am betting on like the opposite of whatever, of what the field thinks is, is going to happen. Right. And that's sort of what happened last night. Not entirely, but it's you're, like, you're betting on stuff to fail. Like it's not that you don't believe in Cole. Yep. It's just yep. that, that if Cole is going to be in your kind, your smaller field contest, if he's going to be 85% owned and he shouldn't be any differently projected than Darvish or Bueller. And in fact, in the bat, yep. Darvish had higher raw Darvish. points than by a lot than by, Cole, like, by a lot. Right. Uh, you're not, you're not necessarily saying, oh, I think Darvish is going to do well. I think Freed is going to do well. It's just that if Cole just puts up 16, right. Or 18, he has, he has a six inning, seven strikeout, gives up two home runs, two earned run, like just like a game that doesn't, that barely gets him to 20, doesn't even get the win. Right. Like you, you, you have, when you're 16, 18 points, like any pitcher could put up that, like any of the, anyone, like yep. you name anyone on the slate could Casey Mize. Any, I mean, anyone on the slate could have had. So you're just banking on the fact that Cole doesn't put up a ceiling. It's, we talked about this during basketball season that it's, uh, you're betting on your opponent's failure, right? right. So I'm bet- and, and, and specifically the correlation between the things that they're doing failing, right? They are jamming. Those two expensive pitchers, specifically Garrett Cole. So if Garrett Cole, and like you said, the other thing about baseball that I don't think people take into account, and DFS in general, is like Garrett Cole could score 30 points, right? He, he could score, that, that's a good goddamn outing, right? And like at, at, at 10,000 and, and 80%, yeah, that, that, that sucks. That's, that, that's not great. But it's not like the end of the world. Your right. pitchers score 25, right? Max Fried scored before they brought him fucking back out for whatever goddamn uh, unknown reason. He was scoring 25 for 7K. It's like, he uh, said, Casey, Casey Mize. I don't know what he scored, but he it had almost to be pretty... 30 points. I had him yeah, also because exactly. the Mariners yeah. were going to be chalky. I'm like, I'll take the pitchers against the. Ch- if I'm going to play not much Mariners, why not yep. throw in the pitcher? I need I... an SP2. It's not something I do on FanDuel. Because you don't have to play two pitchers. That's why, to me, FanDuel is is much different. Because Fan, yeah. FanDuel, like like Cole was on this slate that we're talking about, Cole was in the... Because I played one. I played the 150 Mac. I played both of them. Mm-hmm. Because this was the first day with no NBA, so they bumped up the prize pools and lowered yep. the entry fee. So I'm like, I could, I could legitimately 150 Max and not feel like, you know, it's 600 on both sites. I mean, it's like, okay, right. I... I'll play 150 on both. I'll I'll treat myself or whatever. And I I almost <laughs> I almost got there on both sites, with the uh, with the, I had I had plenty of the White Sox on FanDuel because they were less owned on FanDuel. Yep. I barely had the White Sox, but my best lineups were White Sox. I mean, I still had enough right. that I was close. Right. I was you know top 50. I was on FanDuel. I was in first place for a bunch of time. I had a couple of lineups that were bouncing in between first and what I, Freed was three point seven percent owned on FanDuel because no one pays down a pitcher. That's that because on FanDuel yep. you don't you you never really need to. Uh, but on FanDuel, uh, Cole was thirty seven percent owned. Darvish was like twenty percent owned, and Bueller was like twelve percent owned. And I don't know where the, all the other owners. It goes around the other Kikuchi. I guess was sixteen percent owned. Something wow. like like. You're only playing one pitcher. Mm-hmm. So to me, uh, it's even m- more like you, like Cole at 37% owned is not like mega, right? Like yeah. I wouldn't mind that. I mean, I played more Darvish anyway because he was projected mm-hmm. better in the bat. But yeah. like on DraftKings, when you have to play two pitchers, it forces the field to play pitchers that, that, there you could we could look at that slate yesterday and you could feel right yes that yesterday slate i think you look at cole and go i feel comfortable mm-hmm. darvish i feel comfortable bueller i feel comfortable kukuchi against the tigers i could deal with that even freed against the mets he was 11% owned so it's like okay yep. i i i've been but i mean it's an eight game slate there's 16 pitchers on the slate <laughs> after those five pitchers you're like I don't trust anyone, right? You just like it. Yep. After that, it's kind of like uh, they're either overpriced or you can't. I don't know what to get. like. And people really avoid. They're like, I'll go down to what I what I am comfortable with, and that's it. Now on on yep. draft on Fanduel, since you only have to play one pitcher, 
Like, I could throw out. Like, there's no way I'm playing Casey Mize on FanDuel yesterday. Mm-hmm. I mean, just what's the need of doing that? Like, there's just no... The pricing is soft, so I can, like, if I could play one of the studs. I could play Kikuchi. I could play Freed. Like, why am I playing Jordan Lyles on FanDuel? Like, like, yep. like the chances of him outscoring any of the other pitchers. And do I need all that? Playing a 6K pitcher on FanDuel, like, you, you can't even spend the salary. I mean, you could pay up at every spot and, not, and still have money left over. So it's like now that makes, and then obviously any type of lineup like that is more likely to look the same. Also, like, oh, I'm going to play the, yep. four, I'm going to four four the two most expensive stacks with the two most expensive hitter. And, and, well, that's all Jordan Lyles lineups are going to look like. I mean, exactly. Right. Unless you're going to leave 5,000 on the table. You mentioned, you mentioned that earlier, but I did want to hit on that again because, because I talk about it. And I don't think even, even as we say it, or like if I write it or you even say it on the pregame, on the pregame show, I don't think people quite, quite understand that. It's like you, you think you got different. Right by this, like you said, this one percent tiger stack or this one percent, whatever stack, and it's like, but it, it, in turn, well, you you ended up doing the absolute opposite thing because the only possible combinations of of that team are you know X Y Z. So the like especially in the large field, right? You said there's right, 700 right. In the tigers. smaller field, I don't, I don't have to worry about it as much, but in the large field, because you might literally have the only tiger stack, right? In in that. The issue, the issue, even in the smaller field, specifically, specifically on DraftKings, specifically in the, um, you know, uh, this element that we're talking about here is these t- these Tiger stacks are not even that much cheaper <laughs> than the good stacks. I can't remember it, it, um, the Yankees were in Camden, were in Baltimore, in Camden, and they were. I remember they were. I forget if they were. It was Kramer or whatever trash can Orioles pitcher that was out there and the Yankees are chalked for the fourth day in a row and the Yankees stack was the second cheapest stack on the whole slate with the highest run total by like a run you know in and it, and it's just like you know what do you like what do you do besides x out every Yankee and pray, you know and pray, and pray the you're stays, right and just stays pray. in the bar stays in the ballpark but it's like that element is is into it too that you think like oh I can play this this garbage right I'll pay up and then I'll, I get the leverage with Kikuchi. They're one. They're one percent. I get the two studs. It's like, well, everybody has two studs. Not you know, everybody's a, a exaggeration, but everybody has two studs, and everybody also has White Sox with two studs. Everybody has the Yankees with two studs because yes, they used Taylor Ward or Kalenic or I mean, even like Scope was that not not you know one percent because he was almost min min priced and first base was garbage yesterday. It's like. So now you you have this Tiger stack. So not only do the Tigers, they actually have to be like the highest scoring team. It isn't like you said back back in the past when it's like, oh, dude, I can I could probably get there if the Tigers score eight runs as long as the as long as the right things break my way elsewhere on the slate. Right, the the pitching comes in my way. Now it's like, the, well, the pitching didn't give you any edge, and then the one offs probably didn't give you any edge because everybody has those guys and everybody actually has those one offs in their team's stacks. So it's like you have Trout. Now you're fading Otani and the rest of the Angels. So it's like if all the Angels go off, your Tiger stack was useless, you know, or the White Sox. Like, yeah, you you played the cheap Tigers and the and and Mercedes, but you know, if the White Sox go off, you, you still need the Tigers to beat those other teams. So you have the same combination as every other Tiger stack, and you're not getting any advantage in terms of a a, a roster construction. Like we talked about at the beginning, that has completely flipped. Absolutely, completely flipped on on both sides, but definitely on it's way, way, way more dramatic on on DraftKings. And so, you know, it, every slate, like I say, it, I say it every day. We have to like assess every slate and contextualize every slate. And I didn't like double pay down, which I have done that. I, I did that with the Cubs example that we talked about. It's almost you know, impossible just, to double pay I'm, down. Yeah, yeah. You I, on Fanduel? We were talking about Fanduel. I I played. I think it was Sunday. Um, I played my favorite. I was just like, ah, I'm, I'm lazy. We were, we were getting the, vac- the second dose of the vaccine. I'm like, I'm just going to toss something in while we're waiting. And I'm like, I'm just plugging in my favorite teams. I'm not really worried about ownership. I'm not playing that much. I couldn't spend with the most expensive pitcher and like angels, you know, so I have, tr- <laughs> you have Trout, Otani, Rendon, whatever. And, and I think uh, I was playing Giants. So the Giants were cheap. 
I, and Freddie Peralta was the most expensive pitcher. I had the 1500 left over and that's using trout. That's using Otani. That's using these. So the, the, the pricing is just so ridiculous that you really, really, really have to think about, you know, these things that we're talking about here, like h- how specifically on this slate do, do I go about getting leverage? And it is almost always this construction idea. In, in my opinion, people think it is like, Oh, take the top stack and fade them or take the top pitcher and fade them. And it's like, sometimes I guess maybe, you know, when we get these 90% owned pitchers, it's possible that's enough, but like it, it is so much more about this, this context of who our opponents are playing and it all starts with those pitchers. Right. Like yesterday, I 150 lineups on DraftKings, lineup HQ. I made the group Cole Darvish, max one. Yep. Said that to me, that's the, the easiest way for have 150 lineups that are automatically, I could I could play. I don't have to. It's almost I don't even have to worry about ownership anymore. Yeah. At that yep. point, like once I separate Cole and Darvish together, I can still make Cole Bueller lineups. I can yep. still make Darvish Bueller. I can I can still make two stud lineups, but it won't be Cole and Darvish together because I'm put I'm put making 150. I'm not hand building each individual one. So I can't just inspect each one and go, nope, not this one. No, Vaughn shouldn't be in that one. I'm trying to do something a little bit more efficient than that. But I'm like, the easiest way, it's like if a cold Darvish lineup wins, then I then I lose today. But I mean, to yeah. me, that's this is the easiest way for me to make 150 lineups. And then I, obviously, if I'm not playing them together, I have to find other pitcher. That's why it's like, well, the White Sox are going to be chalky. Hap doesn't project all that poorly. So yeah. I'm going to play 10% Hap. Now that that went badly, obviously, <laughs> but the whole point is like I typically I'm looking for the like I played the Braves and the Cubs and the Dodgers, the sta- expensive uh, more expensive stacks that people were less likely to play that still had high ceiling projections. It's yep. just that their point per dollar value for a median is low, and I I do this for two reasons. One, the construction is different, right? Mm-hmm. The seal, I, the, to me, the median of the lineup is lower. The ceiling of the lineup is higher. Yes. Right? That's still like, I agree. Like, like pe- people are like, okay, well, uh, if the, you build your lineups and you play your chalk stuff, Cole Darvish, whatever, your median is 124. My median is like 117, but my ceiling is higher than yours. Like, my ceiling, yeah, I have my, better. I have better hit. I, ju- I just have better hitters than you, probably in better matchups than you. And people don't understand that the gap in pitching is nowhere near as, as, as much as they think it is. It feels worse when it happens. Mm. When Garrett Cole throws that complete game shutout with, with 14 strikeouts, that's, a, that's not very fun, right? He posts 60 fantasy points. Yeah, you lose by a lot. But 98% of the time, even when he has a good start, he does – like you said, Casey Mize scored 30, scored 30 fantasy points. Even when Garrett – it's just not physically possible for a pitcher to distance himself that much you know, from, from his peers. Um, so people don't take that into, into account enough. So yes, I'm going to lose when Garrett Cole does do that, when Jacob deGrom does get 15 strikeouts in, in a complete game shutout. And on the flip side, when, when he does that, and Taylor Ward hits hits a home run. Yep, yeah. Uh, that's just you're just not gonna win those slates. But slates like last night, where you know that was ext- an extreme uh, end of the, the the bad spectrum for Cole. But that's just that's just baseball, right? Had he scored 18, I don't really think it would have been that much different, right? The point was he failed. Whether it's 18 or 10 or whatever, the, he lost. The fail for a pitcher, pitcher of that ownership and that price is not hitting a ceiling. It's not. Having yep. 25 is failing. Like, you, yep. in order to get beat by that, he needs 30 to 35, 40. I mean, Darvish put up 37 and Bueller put up 30. So yep. even if Cole put up 35, he still failed because yep. these other two pitchers at similar prices and lower ownership, he didn't beat. Right? And so, like, even then, point, even then, he puts up 35 points and still fails. And even then... Freed puts up 25, and I don't know what Kikuchi ended up with, but um, he battled back, and he was okay. He got 20 hours and, or something. Yeah, and my and and Mize put up a big game, and it's like, okay, those guys, e- even though they, even if Cole had the, the big game, and even though they lost to Darvish and Bueller, if the cheap hitting failed, 
and the whatever was the Braves scored 15 runs as opposed to the White Sox, right? The White Sox score two and the Braves score score 15. The Braves and the Cubs, right? right. The Braves and the Cubs are the are the you know both score 15 runs. Well, you need them. You know, you need those guys. So how do you get the only way you get them is with Casey Mize and Max Fried and, and Kikuchi and Lyles or whatever. So it almost doesn't matter what you know, Garrett Cole scored 30. Cool. I got 20 and my and 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 I hit the offense. Right. So you had you had Jay, right. Because because the, the whole point is that what, what really we're talking about and what, what we talk about a lot when it comes to strategy lineups, not players. Right. Yep. They we're talking about constructions. So, like, there's 10 on DraftKings. You're rostering 10 players. So, if you roster the two stud pitchers, all those lines, I'm not saying you, the rosters that have Cole Darvish in it are more likely to have Kellenic, Ward, Scope, uh, Vaughn. Yep. Now, in GBP, like... Madrigal, like, yep. Right, Madrigal, right? In GBP, you're looking for the high, your high score, not medians. That's your cash game lineup. So, good, good luck. Double ups, you're fine. But you're looking at scoring like 200 plus points. So let's say Cole puts up 40 and Darvish puts up 40. Okay, great. I got the right combo, whatever. But if if Vaughn, if all the cheap hitters get zeros, you ain't winning the GPP. Like, but that's yep. the only way you could make that combination. That's the whole point. So like, if if you're if Acuna puts up d- double dongs, Soto double dongs, and and the the Cub, let's say the Cubs Nationals game goes 12 to 10, and Bryant has two home runs. Bias has two home runs. Bryant has a you know, how do you, how do you fit all these guys in? And you need you also needed the Acuna, Acuna two home run two stolen base one off at yep. six thousand. And it's like okay, great. You have your lineup that gets eighty points at pitcher, and then eighty points at hitting. I have my lineup that gets forty points at pitching and 180 points at hitting. Like, <laughs> yeah, right. like you didn't even need... They, they scored the highest amount of points, yet, nope. I, and, and and the stacks that I played were 4% owned. I mean, like, because like, not many people could play that combination without playing a Jordan Lyles or a Casey Mize or yep. anything like that. Now, what we're saying goes completely against what variance is in baseball, right? You think in terms of variance-wise, you'd rather just... Pitchers are more projectable. Hitters, you don't. You anybody don't want to, can hit a home run, right? right. Anybody can. Any hitter Anyone. can score. But the problem oh, comes yeah. in is that the cheap, the cheap stuff now is the chalk, <laughs> right? The, the the problem is is that Nick Marigal is twenty percent owned, and it's like no, that's the type of guy I look at and go, go. Well, no one's going to play Nick Madrigal batting second for the White Sox. At, he's going to be four percent owned, right? No, what ends up happening is that Danny Mendick is the low on part of that stack because yep. people are going to play magic all over him. And then he's the one that hits the grand slam. Like mm-hmm. you could do, you could make stacks kind of like that, but this goes completely the, like playing MLB from 2016 through 2019. It's, it's a byproduct of the pricing. If, if, if DraftKings had a salary floor of 3,500 for all hitters, then then we wouldn't be having this conversation anymore. So, no. like, to me, this isn't the field doing something like, oh, 2016 to 2019, like, all of a sudden in 2021, like, people have just, like, gotten, like, like oh, we all got to do this one thing. Like, no, no, from a median perspective, it makes sense. But from a, a ownership leverage and a ceiling perspective, it doesn't necessarily make sense. And do you think, Eric that a lot of this, uh, especially in the larger field stuff, although there's still plenty of dead money, people, casual players playing and whatever, mm-hmm. do you think a lot of this, a lot of this uh, ownership condensement comes down to what I, what I say on the pregame show a lot, uh, people not knowing how to use optimizers well. They're using projections. They're focusing too much on medians and yep. without doing a, a significant things to supersede, tell the optimizer no. Uh, it's gonna just. Uh, I'm gonna give you. I'm. I'm giving you 36% Nick Madrigal one offs. I'm giving you. Uh, I'm giving you 22% Tyler Ward one offs. And you take a look at that median projection, and it looks nice. But you take a look at the cumulative ownership, 
and it doesn't look nice. And you take a look at the ceiling and it's, it's no different than ceilings of 5,000 other lineups that are twice as less owned. And then, and then people just go, well, this is what the projections tell me to do. Yep. And as if the, if the chalk gets there, I have a lot of chalk lineups, right? And if the, and if it gets there, it gets there. And if I have the right combination or whatever, uh, do, do you think a lot of it comes down? Because to me, if I mean, because I could go right now to line of HQ and make those. I mean, I see it. I mean, that's I, I'll do that. I'll make 150 and go. This is what people will do. Like I could just yep. see. I mean, it's just it's 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 almost impossible not to. And then I look at that and I go, how do I do the opposite of that? Yet still, exactly. I still want pieces of. I'm not because uh, I'm different than you. Because obviously, I'm not just playing one lineup, two lineup, three mm-hmm. lineups. I'm playing 50 lineups, 60, 100 lineups. So. Oh, the White Sox are chalk. X them all out. I don't. I don't necessarily do that. It's like right. I could still play a couple of White Sox lineups that I could get. Now I'm playing Jordan Lyles. And in that to, line. I'm doing. And to that be clear, I I don't either. Right. I I played the White Sox last night. My lineup, like if you put, if you looked at my my lineup from last night, you like run through the ownerships. You're like you're not a contrarian player, right? If you just solely looked at the raw ownerships, you're like well, White Sox are the chalkiest stack, and like Josh Bell had some ownership because he was cheap. You know, yeah, but Soda, uh, Darvish, in your contest, like, Soda was what five percent owned or something? Yeah, like three, three. Right. There was one when, when you can get someone like Juan Soto at three percent owned, you're a contrarian. Like that. That's the essence of being contrarian. It's like what we say in basketball, Eric. We have a ten yeah. game, eight game, ten game slate in basketball, and it's like people are like, "Well, who gets the blowout run?" They're looking for the seventh guy off the bench, and I'm like, "Like, dude, like they're gonna be uh, Devin Booker's gonna be two percent owned today." Like, so there's going to be, there are going to be plenty of people. Jimmy Butler is going to be 4% owned today. Why don't you just do that instead of look for this $3,500 guy that somehow has a career game once every, every season and you hope yeah. it's tonight. It's like, no, you could find a good, I saw, I did the same thing in large field. Soto, Acuna, Acuna was 7% owned in large field against Walker. And he, he and he is like always the chalkiest hitter ever you know every every slate where the braves look okay acuna is like you know the the garrett cole of hitters and, and I, I mean i get it he's arguably the best the best offensive player in baseball you know when he gets in a good matchup he always <laughs> when he, it's like he knows his ownership when he's 40 percent the you know that the leadoff home run is coming judge every also knows time. his ownership also judge, yep every time they're 40 percent you're just waiting for the assholes in whatever chat or twitter that you're on to post all rise right you right. fade aaron judge and you just know these assholes right. and judge you know 3300 on fanduel for no apparent <laughs> reason and it's like i'm just gonna plug him in and i'm gonna fade a buy i'm gonna have very little of him on fanduel it's like okay once he hits the home run i'm like okay close my laptop on the gpp lineups and i know i doubled up in cash games <laughs> right exactly exactly but it, the, the, the NBA thing is such a perfect perfect transition because it actually speaks to to exactly what we were talking about in kind of a in kind of a weird way because the field has gotten smarter and so when we think about it in the NBA sense it's like whatever thirty five hundred value play in general right over generalization but in general whatever thirty five hundred NBA value play is like so much better than the other thirty five hundred value play because it's like so and so is out right so using today as an example Karis LeVert is out for the Pacers so if anybody's playing NBA there's going to be somebody right I don't know who it is but somebody that is some value play that's benefiting from that because pricing came out before we found out about Karis LeVert being out it's like fading that guy it's like I'm not saying you can't do it you know everybody has different risk tolerances and different strategies whatever but it's like you're drawn to such a low probability outcome and then you're also probably playing the chalk at the higher end, right? You're playing you're playing Kyrie instead of Jimmy Butler. And it's like you kind of just negated the thing you were doing <laughs> the thing the thing you were doing to get less of an edge on <clears throat> on the field. In in baseball, people have also gotten smarter, right? Everyone sees Taylor Ward in maybe the best matchup of the night is Min Price hitting leadoff in front of freaking Otani and Trout and and Rendon. Right, Jared Kalenic is one of the better prospects in baseball for cheap in a good matchup, hitting leadoff, right, et cetera, et cetera. Everybody sees those, but in baseball, that the variance is so high that those guys in turn went from the best plays to now the worst plays, right? Depending upon your lineup, 
And right, if, issue... if anything, if anything, when I when I when I go into lineup HQ, when I build my lineups, if anything, those are the players that I'm avoiding. Correct. It's it's a complete. It's the good. It's and and it's very similar. We talked comparing it to basketball. We we've said on on this podcast. I mean, we've talked about it. That thirty five hundred dollar value play in basketball. Right, the point guard's out, and what this guy's gonna get thirty two minutes or whatever. So many times, people think in terms of this guy is going to be seventy percent owned. Right? Yep. Who do I play instead at thirty five hundred dollars? And like, that's not the right. The right no. mentality would be that that player projects so much better than any other thirty five hundred dollar player. There's no for you to just replace that guy one v one. You're killing yourself. Like. You're still playing the same lineup as everyone, just with a worse player in it, yeah. hoping that that 1v1 gets there. Uh, and then people go, well, maybe I should pay down at another spot. And I go, mm-hmm. okay, now you're thinking a little bit better, right? So I'm going to pay up in the spot that everyone's going to pay down and pay down in the spot that everyone's going to pay up. But now you're paying down for a $3,400, $500 player at a different position that sucks also. So <laughs> the, the, what, I, what, I, what I tell people when they're like, well, then what do I do? I said, why do you build a lineup that doesn't need a $3,500 player? Right? So yep. you're not even in that range that you have to even compete against. You want to build a lineup that wins when the lineup that goes stars and scrubs loses. It doesn't yep. matter whose scars and whose scrubs, just that construction loses. So we see in baseball where I take a look at my lineups and I go, yeah, I'm getting... Andrew Vaughn one-offs. I'm getting Tyler Taylor Ward one-offs. And I'm bumping yep. down. I'm going, I only want 6% Taylor Ward. I only want 4% this. Like, I'm trying to jam so I'm not getting, like, them as well. I, but it's not replacing it with some other $2,200 guy. It's just now building lineups that are more balanced. Right? So I'm not, not- I'm not, I don't even have a $3,000 guy in it. It's, I'm now playing a stack that's 3,800, 4,200, 4,400, like, and then yep. going up and down a pitcher, so I'm playing Darvish Freed, and then like like no one in my no one in my lineup is less than thirty four hundred dollars, and it's and like it's not because to be clear exactly what you're saying, and it's not because you can't do that or you can't win playing whatever. It's just Some easier to win. It's easier. You're creating. I always call it. I'm trying to find the cleanest path to first place. That's what I like constantly am saying. What is the path of least resistance, right? What what couple of things have to go my way? Because a, a DFS lineup, right, in and of itself, is this massive parlay, much even way much harder than a than a parlay. You know, I have to hit this ten leg parlay, probably even more things into account than just hitting this this ten leg parlay. Then once I hit said parlay. Now I still got to beat other people. Now, now I have, there's other people that hit their parlay that night, right? Now I have to beat them, you know? And, and they probably were on a lot of the same things that, that, that I was on. It's like, I want to get, I want to hit, I need to hit that parlay. I'm not going to hit it that often. When I do, how do I maximize the amount of money I can make, you know, because I, because I hit that parlay? How can I minimize the amount of people that I have to beat after I've hit that parlay, which in turn is what maximizes your your money, right? And so I'm just betting on this alternative outcome and still playing a good team, right? Like you said, I'm playing, I'm not I'm not going out of my way to play some trash nine hole hitter, right? I'm not going out of my way to play overpriced Taiwan Walker, right? Against against the Braves. Right, just, just to be because, just to be different. Just to be, Right, he's oh he. No one's gonna play him because he's well. No you know, one's gonna play a lot out. of other people. Also, yeah. I, I I hate when people when people I, you mentioned that in the, in your your blog today, where people are like you know contrarian wise, it's like they get too contrary. It's like dude, like you said, there's no such thing as too contrarian, but people. I don't think people like in baseball, maybe not in other sports a little bit differently, but yeah, in you could. Get, a lineup like yours looks like it's not contrarian, yet it is. Yet there are a lot, and and the lineup that I mentioned with the cheap Tiger stack that has no other options other than the Cobinatronics. Just if you were to set your set even a salary floor of forty nine five, a lot of people do that. 
Like in the, yep. if they, when they're building lineups, even 49,000, you'll get more options. But if you set it at 49.5 and try to plug in that cheap Tiger stack and then run, like it's quite possible that I won't get a hundred lineups. Mm-hmm. I, it, it's it's quite, I, I, I may not even get, and, and you're, and if all these guys are going to be correlated to one another, the likelihood of all these guys being in the same lineup with there's 50,000 entries and this stack is 1% owned, like maybe it's not 500 lineups, but maybe it's 200. Like, dude, you're doing, you're, yep. you're, you're, you're being contrarian. Your ownership sum looks low, yet you're playing a lineup that actually is more likely to be duped than the chalk yeah. lineup that you pl- the, the, the exactly. duped in the large. I'm talking about duped in the large field than the mm-hmm. chalk lineup that you're playing that has no one that's on un- that no one that's single digit. Like you have a three percent on Soto, and then all of a sudden it's like this, this, your duplication factor goes down to nothing. Like at, at that, I, like your yeah. combination is just is not there because. You could have made that that other even in that White Sox stack, and the two pitches that you played, the three one offs that you could have, or the three man or whatever. Mm-hmm. There, there's probably thousands. Oh, I mean, I mean, yep. the, of ways even to fit within forty nine five, yep. like because you have so much because you, you could have gone up and down in different Trout Ward. You could have done. That's a chalky. Con- you could have gone to anything. You could have played the Tigers there. You could have played. You know, you could have played Jacoby Jones as a one. You, there's so many combinations of that that your lineup, even though it has a higher ownership sum, and this is where that ownership sum versus ownership product thing comes in. That people mm-hmm. look at ownership sum and they go, "Well, my Tiger stack lineup has an ownership sum of uh, 68, and your lineup has an ownership sum of 112." And I'm telling you that the 112 lineup. Is it more contrarian lineup than the 68 one? I mean, like... Because it has a clean path to first place. Right. Your Tigers lineup, there's, like you said, there's almost no path to, to first place. By yourself, it's right? Like, there's almost no path it, by, by yourself, yourself to first place. Yourself, if if exactly. this ownership is correct. Right. If, they, right. And if, if the Tigers are twice as owned, you're fucked. Yeah. Because yeah, now, exactly. now, now you've just duplicated... The, 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 now you have twice the amount. If you're off on this and people are like... They're going to try to hedge stack against against Kikuchi, and now now uh, uh, you have a uh, good rum at two percent instead of 07 percent. Like now it's like, well, I was able to fit in Soto Acuna and Contreras, and like yeah, that yeah, that that's all the all the Tiger stacks look like like whole yeah, exactly. Darvish Tiger stacks all look like that's that is all of them. Which like is, they, what else? But, would but that be? is that's also such a uh, maybe a natural transition, but also such a really good point that we've seen multiple times this year. That that so first of all, like the White Sox thing, ownership has you know, um, we've talked about it a little bit. We definitely talked about it in a lot of other sports that you know people are evol- everyone is working off the same baseline of ownership, right? They are everyone's pivoting, and so we see things like the White Sox coming in higher owned than I thought than I thought that they would be. However, we are also seeing maybe this is like even more important, um, especially for people who you know think they're being sneaky and contrarian, is the you know, quote unquote leverage stack, right? Oh, Kikuchi is going to be owned. So, you know, I need cheap bats, right? Because I'm spent, I'm spending up. I can get leverage on those Kikuchi guys by playing these, these tigers. And the next thing, you, you know, you think you're playing this one for, you think you're doing everything that we're talking, set aside the, the uh, issues with what we talked about with, you know, they actually don't have leverage. Set, set that aside. Let's say you even do, you think, Okay, I'm going to be sneaky. You know, I'm going to play Ramos and I'm going to play Scope and I'm going to play Jacoby Jones, even if it's just like a three man. And the next thing you open up, Ramos is like 15 (laughs) percent and Scope is like and Scope is like 10 percent. You're like, not only do I not have leverage, they're they're just as own, maybe higher own than Kikuchi. Right. We we saw this with the Marlins. This happened with the Marlins against Luke Weaver. Uh, relatively recently, I, I same same thing happened to me. It happened with um, on a short slate. Nick Pavetta. Everyone sees the same thing. Everyone is working off of the same baseline of information. You don't think even Joe Schmo off the street knows that Nick Pavetta has a chance to blow up, or you say Kikuchi has a chance to blow up, right? Or Luke, I, I can pull up the app. I can sit on my couch and look at Luke Weaver's game log and see, hmm, eight runs he gave up last start. Hmm, six runs he gave up the start before that. He's projecting at fifty at fifty percent ownership. Like, 
I could just play some Marlins against him. Like that's what that's what I've learned over the years, right? That's that's a good GPP play. And the next thing you know, Luke Weaver's fifteen percent, and the Marlins are the second second chalkiest stack on on the slate. Take take a it's look a, at yesterday, Eric. Take a look at yesterday's slate. One of the things that I had to wonder was what the field was going to do with Madison Bumgarner mm, yesterday, because yeah. Bumgarner had in the past five starts has looked amazing. Yes. Do you don't realize that it was against the Marlins and the Rockies, right? <laughs> right. I mean, just, just and one of them was against uh, a, a decent team, uh, yeah. the Dodgers, right? He did, or was it the Dodgers? It was it was a decent team, uh, I can't. Washington or so, something like that. Yeah, uh, yeah. Proje- if if you take a long term sample size for Bar- Bumgarner and projections, he's not a good pitcher Bad. anymore. It's right, bad, he's not yeah. a good pitcher anymore, and the Dodgers are actually a pretty good hitting team, even though they had a bunch of people out of their lineup. Uh, I was under the like, how many people are going to think that you know Seager's out, you know Taylor's not in the lineup, the Dodgers, it's the pool holes is batting cleanup now, right? <laughs> yeah. uh, and go, uh, they see the recent success for Bumgarner, and he was like eight thousand or something like that, and go, well, that's a pivot off of Kikuchi or something, mm-hmm. something, and then the. And then the Dodgers, because my attitude was, do I play the Dodgers or do I play Bumgarner as being yeah. contrarian? One of the two. And my mm-hmm. assumption was that even though ownership, projected ownership was based on a much lower projection, which puts him at like 4% owned, the Dodgers are also not going to be owned. So I just decided yep. if anything, if there's, if, if it's going to be wrong on one side, Bumgarner is going to end up being 16% owned and the Dodgers are even right. lower owned. That it yep. wasn't going to be the other way around where people are going to try to attack Bumgarner. And then I go in going, okay, let me check Bumgarner's ownership. And he was barely owned. And it's yep. like, it's like the only, it, Joe Schmo off the couch would look at the game logs of the past five games and go, how do I not play Bannison Bumgarner at 8,000, even though against the Dodgers or whatever. And he still wasn't owned. I mean, like he, mm-hmm. like, and he still was not owned. So I, and then, and, and same for Freed. They look at Freed and go, well, Freed should be higher on that. Like I thought, Freed was actually going to be chalky. Yeah, to some extent, he was a, in the large field in DK was eleven percent. Especially when and he was he was three percent in that. Qual- there was one other per- you know, It's a small field. There was one other person that had that had Freed, and he paired him with Cole, right? So it was like like you so it's like about no one had Freed. I know. It's 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 basically like no one had Freed. Like all I had to do was play Freed and not play Cole, and I could literally do whatever the hell. It, it didn't, it, it, you know, it if I matter. wanted to play, it didn't. Not, not, nothing mattered, and so that that you know continues to go back to like just these really really small little simple things. But you're assessing the slate from this high level, right? It sounds like we're talking about plays, whatever. Insert whatever name you want for Cole and Taylor Ward and Andrew Vaughn and and Max Freed. They're all chess pieces in this game that, that we're playing. But like I, I going into every slate and kind of assessing it from that way, what are, the, what are the couple of little moves? Where do I have to move my pawn, right, to give myself the path to, to, to check? Like there's only a, there's only a couple. Right. And it, these are the big decisions. Really we we talked about last week, remember, with your blog and writing down the morning pages. All yep. the people that we're mentioning were, were using yesterday's slate from this podcast as an example, which is what we do on this show normally, right? Like during NFL season, we're talking about the slate before. So a lot of people may be coming here, oh, guests and evergreen or whatever. It's like, you have to relate these concepts to every slate that you play, but we're using the past slate as, as an example that those big decisions, like we could, I could look and I could look at uh, yesterday's slate and go, okay, Cole Darvish, who, who are the two chalk pitchers? Who's the chalk cheapo hitters that are going to make this construction? And then once I know, once to me, that's the only information I need. Yep. And then everything else is, everything else is just what, what do I say? Like, that's where play that, you know, to me, MLB DFS is, is like 10 times simpler than NBA DFS. So like, simple. Right. Because so people simple. overthink these things. Like you said, why did you play the Nats? Well, they, because they, they projected decently and they fit. Yep. Right. It's not like you saw that they projected decently. Did they project yeah, the best? No, but they weren't poorly projected. Why did you choose the Nationals over the Twins? Because the Nationals projected better than the Twins. Right. That's about. Exactly. That's about it. And then, I you played the White Sox. You wanted to play. 
And it's like, I have two outfield spots and a first base spot. Who fits? Who fits? And, 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 and like you said, I, I uh, you know, you could do one, you could do five, one, 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 you could do five, two, one. There's like, you said, there's thousands of combinations. My personal playing style and preference is to like, I try to, it, it's, in the small field, you, you want to just get two things right, and that's it. I, yeah, I, I just it minimize the amount of things that I that I have that I have to get right because of the conversation we're having here. I'm I'm almost not betting on my team. I'm betting I'm betting that my opponents fail. Right, in which case, you know, like Soto, like I won, and Soto scored three points. He didn't have a hit. He had a, he had a single in the ninth inning. He didn't have a hit until you know, and I didn't even have the perfect White Sox. You know, I didn't have Mendick. Honestly, Tim Anderson Mercedes. wasn't that good. And I didn't have and I didn't have Mercedes, but it was a bet against my opponents. And then once once you bet against your opponents and they do fail, now you just need like a good enough team, right? And that's why that's where the five three thing comes in for me is because I don't need you know I don't need to hit all these one offs you know because I just needed the White Sox to do well enough and then these Nationals to do well enough. And I had their three you know outside of Trey Turner, who of course hit a home run. I I, I just needed you know their best hitters. And then you're like, okay, I bet against my th- those guys, and then I have this combination of of pretty good, pretty good, but imperfect plays. But that's good. At, that I don't need perfect, right? But people, but people will spend the time to go through and go, well, how to, to try to to back engineer, you know, well, how did you choose? Like they think it's because you studied for three hours and like the Nat Schwarber is perfect here, like you. Number number one, the projections are already done for you. Like I show in the pregame, the morning show, since I use the bat as my primary projection source, mm-hmm. I'll just I'll, I'll look at the st- I'll look at the stacks page. Yeah. I'm not even looking at individual hitters. I'm just looking at like who are the top ceiling stacks of the day, and I go I look and I like the, the for the, what, today's slate. I'm like okay, the Braves, the Rays. Well, that makes sense up against Yamamoto and Harvey. And I mean, I, I just take a look at the ceilings and and then the point per dollar. And I go, OK, uh, the Brewers play. This is going to and I just who are the cheap hitters that are, are going to be jammed in? Who are the chalk pitchers? I look and it's like, OK, probably probably Wheeler and Snell and Snell on FanDuel's is, is 8K for some <laughs> reason. So that he's going to be so now on so now on DraftKings. Wheeler Wheeler Snell is going to start jamming in some some twenty four hundred dollar hitter, but on Fanduel mm-hmm. it's going to be the other story because Snell is going to be eight thousand, which means you could spend up in like every spot on Fanduel, which means yep. all the raw points plays. So the guy that's twenty one hundred is actually not going to be owned because he's only going to be able to be paired into like an overpriced Wheeler lineup. Like what I just explained in sixty seconds. Is what you do on your block. I mean, is is it like you're looking? What is the roster construction that 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 is going to be the hardest path, the 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 yeah. dirtiest path, the <laughs> dirtiest path to first place, and then you go, okay, how do I clean this up? Right, the clean. You're yep. looking for the cleanest path to first, not the most probable path to first, yep. but it's the cleanest path. So when it it's less probable. But when it gets there, you get more money because it's against you. You would you had to deal with eighty five percent coal ownership. That means and how yeah. many? How many? What do you have? A hundred entries in that contest or something? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So eighty five out of hundred lineups had coal. So basically, right. once coal fails and you don't have them, you're competing against fifteen people for first place. How beautiful is that? Yeah. Exactly. And then, and that's then, why people... then it's, it's 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 likely. Imagine the White Sox chalk didn't get there either. Let's just say that that failed mm-hmm. also. So Cole yep. failed and the White Sox failed. And let's say the overpriced Cubs were the one that put up 10 runs. In your contest, there may have been, if you combine how many if, how many lineups did not have either Cole or any White Sox, it could be three lineups. Yep. And then once both of those, just you need one team and one pitcher failing and the three teams... Uh, 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 it could have been the a, a Dodger, a, you know, a, the Mets, a five man Mets stack, even though they only put up like barely any runs, like could have won that, could have won that contest, could have won your contest, qualified for you know, right? Got got yep. to the fifty thousand World Championship, whatever, because it just scored. It like everything else failed, so yep. you know, like no one, no one had you know, and then like the team that goes, the, the team that goes off, 
Let's say, let's say yesterday, uh, the, uh, the, the some other cheap team. Who was the yesterday? Some whatever. Uh, the Nationals go off for something. Nats, yeah. And 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 yeah, the the three entries with Nats have coal in it, right? Yeah. Have, right. Have, yep. have a combination of coal hap, right? Well, they're dead. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't matter that Nationals put up eleven runs in that lineup because. Now it turns out some some just weird team like you just you won the low scoring slate. Yep. You win the low scoring slates but when the chalk fails. Yeah, that's, exactly. That's, that's a, that yeah, that's the, the most sharp players that's how they pl- that is how they play. They don't yeah, play for fail. they they play for the chalk failing and when they're playing small field contests obviously you're playing one lineup. So you're basically saying what's the what's the cleanest path to first place? Right. Now, in large, now people will say, in large field, if you're playing 150 lineups, I don't see these people fading these chalk teams. Is that they go under on them? So, well, why don't they fade them? It's like, well, because that's high variance. I mean, you're putting in a, a lot of the, if you're playing 150 lineups into a $18 contest on, on DraftKings, I mean, dude, you're spending almost $3,000. It's like there are some chalk parts. You could play a Cole Darvish lineup just without the White Sox. You could play uh, a White Sox lineup just like with Carl Darvish. But, so it's not a matter of, oh, they're the chalk X amount. Because if right. you're going to do that, you're eliminating plus EV lineups from your portfolio. And yep. if those are the lineups that hit and you don't have them, you have, you now have a n- minus 90% day. So like on DraftKings, for instance, I barely had the White Sox in 150 lineups. Barely. Yet, the couple of White Sox lineups that I had that came in the top hundred made me money. Like, yep. like literally like I had deadline, I, you know, I'd met stacks gone, right? Brave stacks dead, right? Played a bunch of them played, still played Cubs, got those, but the Cubs were paired with the Mets. So there that's dead. Right. And Oh, I have a, I have a Cubs lineup with Cole. Oh, that's dead. I got a White Sox lineup with Cole. That's dead. Like, but if I don't, if I X out the White Sox and the White Sox put up 16 runs, I run the risk of going, taking $600 and flushing it all in the toilet. I can still make plus EV White Sox lineups. It's just that I'm not going to make many of them, right? Yep. I think they're a yep. higher EV line. Like to me, my White Sox lineups are my towards the bottom lineups. It's like, those are, those exactly. are my diversification type lineups. If I had a choice, I would play more of the other types of lineups, but I would still want to give my, you, you, you take a look, especially like we have the 14 game slate coming up. If you were to run a simulation, uh, of accurate ownership, accurate projections. So the most accurate, most accurate ownership. And he just ran like you do for slate IQ in mm-hmm. a way, which lineups win for what well, if you and you put the payout structure on it, right? So, and you could run, okay, in this iteration, this lineup came in 3,684th for $4, you know, like whatever it is. And you just <laughs> yeah. run up, if you run out these lineups, and let's say you simulated every possible combination on a 14-game slate. I don't know if, even though you'll be able to do that, you know, the computer power to do that, because the way that, you know, how many, com- billions of combinations. Yeah. Uh and you run it out, the expected value range of like the plus EV lineups will be in the tens of thousands. Yeah. Like, I'm, I'm just like, like the difference is between like within a certain range, you obviously have high variance lineups that may have a very high EV, but like you'll realize them like once every like 50,000 contests. <laughs> so it's like, you could play though. You can play those. You can play some of those. Just realize that, like, like the lineup that you leave eight thousand on the table, and you play the cheapest hitters and a pinch hitter, and it's like, like, okay, that actually, actually, based on the projections, it shows as a plus EV. Just it wins once every fifty thousand times. You could yeah, play. It those was even lines. like yesterday. It was even like yesterday. Garrett Cole is is eighty, you know, sixty to ninety percent. There's there's value in playing Rangers against him, as we saw, right? You knock all those lineups down, and you get the three home runs, and the and you know when he gives up steals. There's a lot of reasons why there's value in playing the in playing those Rangers, but and but, not to cut but you, you off, would, but, but you wouldn't play. Fact, 
The point that I'm saying is that even if those lineups are plus EV, from a from a variance control perspective, as far as your bankroll, we you wouldn't play 150 of them. And you don't need you don't have to do that. Right. Right. You don't to win first. You don't have to maximize every drop of expected value. Right. I, I, we could probably sit here and debate. Like I could say for all these reasons, here's why the rain, why you actually should have played, you know, a lot of Rangers based solely on that expected value. And what happens if you're right about the rain? What happens? But you when could the have, it's just by your variance. But, but, the, but Eric, the point that the point that I'm making is that those lineups, if you were plotted out on the chart, like let's say the Rangers leverage stack against Cole, the chalk stud pitcher. Uh -huh. The EV of that lineup may be the same expected value of your lineup. It's right. just that when, if you just look at expected value, it's not like how often it wins first. It's more how much money do you make over each yeah. individual trial on average. Now, that Texas stack makes $50,000 once and loses all your money 99 other times, yep. while your lineup wins first more often wins 10th place more often, but doesn't come in last. Like it, it's not, it's like the Texas lineup when it wins, when it wins, it wins first place all the time it because yep. it's so low owned and leverage against an 80% pitcher, but it just doesn't happen that frequently. Just you, it has 50 occurrences of $50,000 and then everything else <laughs> is garbage. Yeah. You have, yeah. you have instances, trials where you come in 14th, you come in, 28th you come in 100th so you're getting expected you're getting value across the way so if you were to mm -hmm. re, if you were to simulate all of these lineups that you could possibly make 10,000 100,000 a million times in theory you'll find like that Rangers lineup and your White Sox lineup may have the same expected value your yeah. the Cole Darvish Tigers lineup may have a negative expect like like the amount of lineups that have a plus e that have a positive expected value, you you have a choice of 10,000, 20,000 of them, 30,000 of them, 50,000 of them. Yeah. And they're all different types. Like the Rangers lineup in your and the White Sox lineup could have the same expected. Like mathematically, if you if I didn't show you those lineups, like from a median perspective, like you they would they would be equal to one another. The mm -hmm. difference is is that you're not competing for the most plus EV lineups that could possibly be made. It's only as long as you have more expected value than your opponents. So yep. that's why when people see in law in small field contests, lower scores win, but the strength of the lineups is so much more. That's, 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 that's the thing that people don't grasp. They go, they see the small field. They see, Oh, someone with 186 won a hundred thousand dollars in the 777 and the first place in the, in the large field is 220, right? You go, okay, they're not very good players. It's like, but the average, like you take your lineup, just nothing, just whatever it is, an average player's lineup, just so you make a lineup, you're going to put it in the large field contest. Your lineup may be better from an EV perspective than 60% of the field. Mm -hmm. That same lineup you put into the 777 it may be one of the bottom 20% line. I mean, it may, right. Yep. It may be like that, that lineup, your lineup in the large field may actually be slightly profitable. Right. Yet in the small field, it's, it's your negative 30% ROI, like same yep. exact lineup because it's just in comparison to the other lineups in the contest. Yours is so much weaker, especially since the ownership is going to be different. And obviously the, the, the simulation for that type of contest would be different than the large field. But the, yep. the overall point is we talk about like MLB DFS being so much simpler than people think it is. Play whoever you want is based around you have 20,000 lineups that are about equal to each other. Well, which one should you play? Whichever ones you feel like. Whichever <laughs> one's fit. See what's, so what, what's, what's better projected that, I mean, that's the core of DFS. Can you find a lineup that projects the same as other lineups that will be in this contest that will be lower owned. And in baseball, you could find thousands. I mean, you could find yeah. thousands of them. And it just comes down to which 150 do you want to play? Which yep. 50 do you want to play? Which three do you want to play? Which 20, which one do you want to play? So the only difference between me and you, Eric, 
is that you have to be more choosy than, I mean, we, that goes back to the very beginning of when you were on the podcast. It's like, like, I don't know how you do it. I look at this and I go, I could plug, there's so many choices. How do I just nail it down to one? Right. And then, and then you do it and you live with those results. Me, me, anytime anyone hits a home run, I'm like, how much of that guy do I have? Right. Like, like it's very rare that I'm, I know, or I know that like I have more or less of the team. But yep, like when yep. Danny Mendek hits hits a grand slam, I look on FanDuel and go, please, please, because it's not someone that I would have liked looked through and go, make sure I have enough Mendek, right? <laughs> so it's like I'm going, please, please, and then when I see him in six lineups, I'm like, okay, and I see he's two point nine percent owned. But it's like I didn't went out and play Danny Mendek. It's just that I was overweight on the White Sox, and mm-hmm. I wanted and I set my exposures so that I get a wider variety of White Sox. So yeah. I have, so I'm not competing against the same White Sox four man top projected stack. Cause you would say, well, why would you play Mendick over, over this guy? It's like, well, because he's three times less owned, like all the White Sox, st- all the brave stacks, right? All the blue Jays. We see that with the blue Jays a lot, right? Blue Jays oh, yeah. so on FanDuel. I'm not even talking about DraftKings. FanDuel, it's going to be Guerrero, Bichette, Semyon, Teoscar. Like that is yep. the Blue Jay. That is the Blue Jays stack. So if you play Grichik over T. Oscar, or you or Grichik over any of them, if you if you 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 could take a look sometimes on, on on FanDuel especially because you don't have to play a catcher. Blue Jays will be like in large GPPs twenty two percent, twenty five percent owned. Danny Jansen one point four percent. Yep, batting ninth or something, and he hits a home run. It's like. Oh, I, I just, I, why, why would I have played Jansen in my stack and not Guerrero in the catcher first base spot? It's like, well, you know how many Blue Jay stacks are in this goddamn contest? It's like, do I want to have the same exact? Now, it doesn't mean I don't play any of that chalk Blue Jays combination, but I make it a point that if I'm going to play 10, 15 Blue Jays lineups, that I don't want 10, I don't want the same 10 for, like, like Guriel hits a home run and I look and I have zero of them. And I'm like, that wasn't the purpose of me doing, I'm playing yeah. the blue Jays. I'm not playing specific plays. Exactly. I and just want to get the teams a, right. That's a lever that I've started to, to pull more myself. And I do think it works maybe even better for smaller fields and, and higher stakes. It works, it works in general, but it's really interesting because of some of these dynamics that, that we're, we're talking about here. You know, you get condensed chalk, but then we also get, like like the White Sox last night, we're, we're an example. They did not project to be the the stone chalk, right? There were, they, I think that they, you know, once, especially once we saw the lineup, they, they started to, to rise up a little bit, but they were mostly a pivot. Kind of like we talked with the, the Marlins, right? It's like people, everybody is is out leveling themselves. Everybody not is, everyone, is but it's not everyone. It's not everyone. Uh, more people than previously are do are doing this. Are taking into account, okay, Jordan, you know, Jordan, and all these people are playing this, so I'm going to pivot to this. And the next thing you know, a lot of people pivoted to this, right? So that's happening a lot. Like so they, like I the Yankees found, yesterday came in much lower on on DraftKings than I thought they would. Super be. low, yeah. Su- super on Fanduel low. they were shocked because Fanduel they were way too yeah. cheap. So I mean that's a different yeah, story. But they were expensive on DraftKings. on on DraftKings. So you kind of saw the White Sox and them flip. And I did I didn't I didn't really expect that. So we're seeing those dynamics play out a lot right now in baseball. What we're not seeing is what you is what you just talked about. And I used I used to be absolutely the opposite um, when the dynamics were very different. I'd be like, I'm not playing you know, the chalk, the chalk blue Jays, I just fade and hope that the blue Jays fail and play a stack. That's close enough probability wise, you know, to hitting that's much lower owned. Now we're getting a lot of these other, you know, people are pivoting, you know, the white Sox are higher owned than I thought that they were going to be. The but Marlins they're, but are they're not pivoting at pitcher. That's that's the point. They're not, they're not pivoting at pitcher and they're not pivoting within those lineups. So they are, they're playing to, when you're, when you're playing the Blue Jays, you're playing the fucking Blue Jays, right? You're not playing Lord Escuriel. You're not playing, Jansen on DraftKings is maybe a little right. different. No one's but playing you're, you're, San Diego you're, Espinal in the yeah. third base spot. Right. It, it was not that long ago. I played, I played him. I forget. Uh, he had a triple and a stolen base the other day or whatever. Yeah. 
Yeah, I know it was it was it was amazing, and he's one, sub one percent on, on the, the chalk, chalk stack. stack. Like that, that, on, that, right? That that's the thing yeah. that amazes me sometimes, and it's I still come back to this, Eric. Do you think a lot of this is because of projections? I do, yeah. And people not not using them as efficiently, or I, I'm going to say not. They're using it efficiently for median. But not efficiently yes. for for ownership, for ceiling. Like everyone is stuck to that median F points. Now I'm not talking about the sharp players. I'm not talking about right. there's 150 maxers that know exactly they're listening and they know exactly what I'm talking about. That's mm-hmm. the reason why they have eight percent Taylor Ward and they're not jamming him into every every bit of their lineup. Awesome, awesome, awesome. The last time the White Sox played J A Happ, which they they faced them two starts in a row. Now, two J.A. half starts starts in a row. Osimo won like every goddamn cent on that on that slate with Billy Hamilton. Right. And people played the people played the White Sox similarly. They right, but no one plays shocked. ninth hitting twenty five hundred Billy Hamilton. But when he has a double, exactly. a triple, and two stolen bases, like he, he had gets the there. most points on the entire slate on Fanduel. He scored like fifty five Fanduel points. He almost hit for the cycle, and he stole like two. Bit. It was it was unbelievable. I'm look. I had the White Sox, and I'm like. I must be doing. I must be doing okay. I think it was Cole. It was the same thing. It was like the same slate over again, except Cole actually went went nuts. And it was like you needed Cole and you needed a White Sox. I'm like, why am I min cashing? Like I have like the nuts, and I look, and it's like ten awesome O teams with Billy Hamilton at the top, you know. And you're like, oh, okay. And that's the one that you know that's only within the last week. That's the one that sticks out to me. But it's the perfect example. People are playing these teams. But I think it's because of those projections. Like, no matter what the matchup is, Billy Hamilton's not going to project well. Santiago Espinal or whatever. Well, how about the other day? The other day with the Phillies. Nick Maiden, Maiton, Maiton. Two home home runs from the nine hole or whatever. And I look, the Phillies were owned. And he's (laughs) he's, he's 1.2% owned. But but like all the other Phillies are like double digit owned. Yep. Like the disparity in the lineup. Now, yes, he projects much worse. Yeah. But there's there are ways to play the chalks the the chalkier stacks by not. I mean, Elvis Andrews is always at the bottom of the Oakland lineup. You could play. I mean, there's people don't want to play those guys. And I and even in the Roto Grinders Discord, people are like I x those guys out. I go, oh no, I don't x those guys That's, out at all. I get more of them. I, I'm more interested in them. Um, and like I said, this is two years ago. I probably would have had a very different, um, you know, answer to this question. But I just think the evolution of the game and some of these things that that we've talked about. You said it perfectly. I'm targeting the Blue Jays. I understand Vlad Guerrero is better than than Espinal. I understand that Kevin Biggio is better than this guy. I understand that Teoscar is a better hitter than Lord Escariel. But I do, you know, I see I see the same projections that everybody say that the Blue Jays are going to do, do well. Who is to say it's not Gurriel that hits two home runs today instead of Teoscar? And he is 2% and Teoscar is 25. The, it's not that they shouldn't be lesser owned. I agree that they should be lesser owned. But they're 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 lesser owned because that median is is quite a bit different and just other factors like and that are built into the projection but also I think a little bit built into the to the mentality of a DFS player like lineup spot um, and that kind of stuff. Well, also, but, also the split. You know how many times that oh, yeah. I, I play? I play uh, the lefty. Like look, look at look mm-hmm. at uh, look at yesterday. I'm yep. looking at two point nine percent on Jason Hayward. Uh, <laughs> hits lefty lefty off of Lester. I, did I purposely want to play Jason Hayward? No, <laughs> but I was playing a ton of the Cubs. And Hayward, I, how do I not? What am I supposed to x him out? Because Oh my God! It's lefty left. Wow. Well, that decreases his his that decreases his 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 ownership. Look at Otani, and people don't even realize this about Otani that the, the split doesn't even exist for him. He's absurd. Yeah, he does. He that that man is. But he hit he hit home run yesterday. And be, oh, lefty left. Who plays Otani lefty lefty? Said, have you looked at the stats? He doesn't have a split. He doesn't have a revert. He doesn't have a split. Right. He, if the ball hits his bat, if the ball hits its bat, it's going. It's going. A fu- they were. Sh- I was watching it because I'm sweating the Angels. Right. Uh, you know, I'm basically like if Taylor Ward hits a home run, I'm, I, this remote is going through the TV because I'm going to lose. Right. Because 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 Taylor Ward. So I'm so I'm I'm watching. Um, 
and and they're showing highlights of some Otani home runs, and the the announcers are like speechless because it's like the perfect pitch. Yeah, lefty lefty slider down and away. It nearly bounces. Mm-hmm. He's like leaning out like this. He just flicks his wrist. He hit it like 430. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're like, yeah, so please don't talk to me about, oh, I can't play Otani against a lefty. Or like, like you said, even Hay- Hayward is a good example because Lester sucks against lefties. Right. Like, Lester, so, like, that's like, Lester's not a Lester's, strikeout pitcher. I don't give, give a crap. Yeah. Who who gives a shit? You know? And and the and again, the point isn't that you shouldn't lower their median projection or you shouldn't lower kind of the probability and the expectation, right? These are all things we're talking about in probabilistic thinking, but I don't give a shit about that because the most probable outcome is every time is I'm going to (laughs) lose today because I'm not playing the top projected, you know, from a, from a highest probability thing. That's not what I'm doing. If I wanted to do that, I would just go play double ups, but uh, to your your kind of question and point about about that is I think people have gotten really really good at identifying the best plays from a median and highest probability perspective, right? That we can identify the best cash game play. Even casual players can identify the majority of the best, you know, cash game highest probability highest median plays. But what has kind of changed is that that not only is that not super relevant in 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 tournaments it's so over owned compared to plays that are not that different from a probability perspective and probably higher ceiling right you're never going to convince me that taylor ward is has the, has a higher ceiling probability than like the entire slate yesterday right otani okay otani and trout like we, we uh, i could probably be like yep Yep, Otani should be whatever ownership. Taylor Ward was like forty something percent in that qualifier last night. It's like, and and he got on base twice. It's like he had a good game. Well, look at Nick Madrigal. Good... He's owned and he hits his first home run of the year. <laughs> right, right when he's chalk. Yeah, exactly. It's, uh, people, so, some of these guys know Taylor Ward must be just a beta. He doesn't know. He doesn't understand when he's owned. Nick Madrigal. That's like the first. That's got to be the first time he's ever been that owned. And of well, course, he normally he doesn't bat first second. First. He normally bats eighth or ninth. It's, yeah, because he's because he's because that's the only reason he was owned. Because really, his the projection doesn't change much other than he gets an extra at bat expectation. So really, so bump it up point right four or whatever. right. He, but he and he's three K. So he goes from a median of four a five point two to six point four only because. Yeah. He expects to hit one extra at bat where he most likely will ground out. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Or or even if he gets a hit, it's a slap sing it's a slap single. Like right. congratulations on your three points. Now like, I played him, so I am Well, very, he was in the stack. I get it if he's in the stack. Right. I'm very thankful to him for that, but he's another perfect example. Like if you sat here and said playing chalk magical but specifically as a one-off like you're a fucking idiot because it's like this dude like the ceiling probability on him based on his ownership is so so low now he hit it yesterday but the point still remains like that's what we're getting every slate though nick magic like come on nick magical zero career home runs a you know slugging percentage of like like what you and i would put up taylor ward same thing i like you know, we who doesn't like this Kalenic kid. I mean, I'm not a prospect right. expert, well, but, but by everything I look at, he seems fine. But like, th- there's how many hitters are on this slate? Why do? Why are those guys forty percent? Why are those guys because, 10 because times from a median more? perspective? Because uh, it's because to get a higher median projection, those are the guys that mathematically fit in, and that's the reason. The first thing I do is is go separate Cole and Darvish, and then the second thing I could I could have done. I mean, I could control it other ways. I, I could go in and put a group, put Warden, put Vaughn in, put Madrigal in, put Kalanick in, put all those cheap, the cheap ass one off, the cheap ass, you know, the jamming inner beating projection guys, the, the cheapos, put them in a group and say max one. So like, yes, yeah. if they're in a stack, great. But if they're in a stack, I don't have it. I don't have a White Sox stack with Madrigal with a Ward one off or a, or right. a Kalanick one off. If I have a Mariner stack, Okay, that's fine, but I can't in that stack. I can't have a magical one off for a ward like or a Vaughn one off. Yeah. Like, like so, I'm not getting the same construction. I could still and I could still end up with ten percent of those guys. I could still have them in lineups. Just I, it's not a lineup where it's Ward Kalanick magical. I mean, like 
Like to me, that's the complete opposite type of lineup that I want to make. I want I want the th the three chalk one off cheapos and the two chalk starting pitchers. Like like to me, once you do that, like the sky's the limit. Like uh, you could almost I, I, the combinations that like it's 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 a, in a weird way. Uh, it's almost easier for me to control in lineup HQ, making a ton of lineups, doing it that way, because I don't have to worry about, because then what ended up happening, I got a ton of a Domingo Labza, whatever, the, the shortstop for the for the Diamondbacks, yep. right, against Bueller. So you, you throw him, you do, I mean, just to, in order to make the the tool, make the lineups that I want to make, you're, you're hand building, thinking the same way. So you're mm -hmm. building hand built because people will say, "Oh, I'm not building a hundred lineups, and I don't have to use the tools like whatever." No, I'm visualizing this. I'm going. If I were to hand build a lineup, I would not play these any of these four guys in the same lineup together. You're thinking that. You're looking at Cole Darvish going. I'm not going to play one of these two pitchers, right? And then you're going to yeah. go. Okay, I'm going to decide on a stack. Well, I'm playing. Ma I'm playing Madrigal in my White Sox stack. Which means I'm not playing Ward. I'm not playing Kalanick. I'm. I, you're playing Vaughn in that stack also. So now, yeah. and then you take out Cole. You put in uh, Freed. You, you're able to pay up somewhere, and that's Soto. And it's like, right, dude. Boom. Like I, I'm doing the same exact thing. It's just I'm telling the tool to make those types of lineups, and I could see and go scroll through. Okay, those are the types of lineups that I want. And if I go through and I go, no, I'm getting way too much of this and way too much of that. It's because the optimizer is trying to put in shoving those median fantasy points and yeah. I'm telling it and stop it, stop it. <laughs> like get him out, get him out of there. But without having to X these guys out with right. that, I could click in lineup HQ and click on, Oh, I have Taylor Ward in eight lineups. I click on his name and I can look through the eight lineups and I go, yeah, those are weird lineups. Like, so I don't mind Taylor Ward one offs, right? Or it's an angel stack. Okay. Okay. He's in an angel stack. Okay. I get that lineup okay he's and not an angel stack but i do want to what the angels the angel stack thing i do just want to say sometimes people will say that like well i'm going to play the angels and i'm not going to play and, and i'll fade taylor ward in my in my angel stack so i'm not saying you can't you, you, you can't do that but it's like part of the purpose of the stack is he's an appealing part of this he's the best projection he gets you the savings he's hitting lead off whatever like part of the appeal of the stack is playing him like i said there are plenty of ways to build you know, plus EV lineups, like you said, I'm not saying you have to play the chalk guy in in the stack. We just talked about different ways to pivot from within that stack. And also, but and also, when, just, when you people want rules, right, people right, want they want rules. rules. But you could play the chalk guy in the stack. The reason you're playing the stack is because it's reducing the ownership of the guy. Yep. Like if you if you're playing Taylor Ward in your Angel stack, and you're playing Kurt Suzuki at catcher. It wards 23% ownership. Who cares? Because Suzuki's 2% owned. Because most angel stacks aren't going to have Suzuki and Ward in it. And you play Trout and Otani at first base. And you play Rendon at third. And it's like, well, you don't have Walsh. Okay. Well, yeah. most angel stacks will have Walsh over Suzuki. Like, so the ownership that you've now mitigated the fact, like when you play Madrigal and Vaughn and you play Grandal instead of Mercedes. Who cares yes. that you're playing Chalk Madrigal or Chalk Vaughn? But that lineup also doesn't have Ward or Kellenick in it. It doesn't have Cole right. in it. So you're perfectly fine. But you could have gone the other way. You mm -hmm. could have gone, you could have said, I'm going to play Mercedes, but not Madrigal, right? Yep. And you and play Mendick instead. And that would have yeah. it would have ended up coming out about Sound the same up. anyway. Yeah. Uh, it would have been better if you and then Lurie Gar instead of playing Vaughn, you're playing Lurie Garcia. Goddamn Garcia. Vaughn. It's that scrub Vaughn. You got to know. I mean, taking a step back, you got to know going into a DFS slate, there's a guy with the last name Mendick. He has to be a part of your stack if you're jamming jamming that team in. And I've watched enough Andrew Vaughn now to say this guy, maybe he'll be good eventually. He's supposed to be pretty good. He's dreadful. He is absolutely horrible. And so choosing him over a guy with the last name Mendick was clearly a uh, – that's a minus EV decision. Right, but the, all, all these things combine into – into one another. It's not one or the other. It's not one's correct and what's not correct. It right. comes all the way down to the concept that we talk about all the time, the lineups, not players of, well, you have 10 guys in the line, you're building lineups. So you could show me a Taylor Ward one-off lineup and I'll go, that looks good based on who else mm -hmm. is in your lineup. And you could show me one that has him as a one-off and I go, wow, that sucks. 
right? <laughs> Just like <laughs> right. we thought, oh, here's a tiger. Oh, I'm, I'm going to uh, hedge stack against Kikuchi, right? Right, with the tigers. And I go, dude, like, like this, why are you, why are you doing this? Like, and to leave 300 on the table and jam in all the chalk, like, it's going to be duped. Like, every tiger stack <laughs> is going to be duped. And they go, well, this is contrary. Like, you have to think in terms of the whole lineup and really grasp the fact that there could be thousands upon thousands of lineups that are from a ROI EV perspective equal to one another that are 10 V tens, yeah. right? Maybe not 10 V tens yep. at, at some point there'll be some, some type of gap, but some, there's still a lot that are 10 V ten. There, there's, there's still a lot that are, that, that are within reason. Cause at some point you're probably going to still have to play some high projected type right. of gun. We're probably playing like on last yesterday's slate, you're probably playing Cole Darvish or Bueller or something or Kukud, you're probably playing at least one of them. And you're probably yeah. playing at least one of the cheapies or something. Yeah. Part of a stack or something. So maybe it's yep. an 8v8. But still, that's so much higher than what most people think and go, well, uh, there's 16 teams on the slate. Uh, four teams have positive leverage in slate IQ. That means all 12 other teams are you'd lose money playing. And I'm like... Dude, you're playing lineups. You're not playing. You're not even playing teams. You're playing full lineups. The t- the the lineup that has the highest win probability but has negative leverage is still fine to play in a lineup. All it's telling <laughs> yeah. you is that because it's negative leverage, you got to play be different in the rest of your lineup. And yeah, you could you still have, have a lineup that projects well, has a high ceiling, and has a low enough ownership. So it's not a matter of well, the White Sox are chalk, X them out. <laughs> You can, but there are just as many. There, there's probably more White Sox lineups that are plus EV because they're higher projected yep. than Tigers lineups that are lower yep, projected, correct. even though they're lower owned. Or Mariners lineups that are lower projected. It's the balance of the projection and the ownership that matters. But you could you could find one. There's, a, there's, there's some Texas stacks yesterday that were plus EV. That were just mm-hmm. as plus EV as the White Sox. That were that if you wanted to stack against Darvish with the Rockies, there probably weren't as many plus EV right. Rocky stacks, but there were there were some, right? Yep. Obviously, the better projected teams are going to have more available lineups that are going to be projected better. The problem yep. is is that more people are going to have those lineups. <laughs> so it's it's that it's that paradox. It's that balancing act of now in baseball you don't have to worry that much about being duplicated. But it just comes down to when I play 150 lineups yesterday, it's that I still want the White Sox lineups are plus EV that I make, but there'll be a lot of them. I'm going to be competing against a lot of people. So would I rather compete against a lot of people with a similar amount of lineups as other people or compete against less people with the Cubs stacks and me have more of them, right? So it's like, let's say we could narrow this five-man Cubs stack without Cole down to... A hundred people in the contest, but I have 15 of them out right. of the hundred other people have two, one, two, right. Right. McLovin has two of them and you know, Larry Odo has three of them. Like, 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 but I've, I've 15 of them. So yeah. now I, I'm disproportionately, if the Cubs are the top stack, I have more ways of getting there versus the White Sox where that five man combination maybe in 1800 lineups. And do I want 15 of those? Yeah. Right. Do I want 20 of that? Like more people, there are more onesie twosie people that have them. Then maybe, maybe uh Uticao has 18 of them. Right. Do I want to have 15 of them or do I want to just, uh, maybe I just have four. Like it's so overwhelming that I'll, I'll take my little piece of it. But I'd rather have more opportunity, the cleanest path. I like when you yep. say the clean. I, I want to look at where the cleanest paths are, and I want to have more paths to the cleanest yeah. path. Like, yep. like kind of like that's the way I'm thinking. So when 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 I talk in terms of exposure and how much, you know, if I play a hundred lineups, like, oh, why did you play a lot of the Braves yesterday? It's because they had a high ceiling and less people were playing the Braves. Not because of their individual, like, I'm not going, well, this guy's this owned and that guy's that owned. It's that if the Braves, 
who have one of the highest ceilings of the highest scoring team on the slate, that I'm competing with less lineups, and it's less lineups, and I have more of the lineups. So I have more shots at winning, like I said, the example before, right? With 20, if you have 20 lineups and you're only competing against 100 of them, it's much better than having 20 lineups and competing against 1,800 other people. Yep. But it's not the right. ownership of the individual players. Like that, that's that, that I, I think people misunderstand, especially in baseball where things are so much more correlative, mm-hmm. where they're like, well, I'm playing a 3% owned guy and a 10% owned guy. Like, but if they're all on the same team, they're more likely to be owned together. And if you're playing cheap guy, if you're playing Taylor Ward, if I went, I could, if I could bring this into Excel and do this and see how many lineups had Taylor Ward yeah. and Garrett Cole in it. And if a lot, yeah. Taylor Taylor Ward was like 23% and Cole was 64%. So like if you were to do if they were independent of one another, you'd multiply the two and go 0. 0.64 times 0. 0.23 and it would say 14.7% overlap, right? But the mm-hmm. problem is is that you have a that's not taking into account roster construction and salaries. So it's not going to be 14% of the lineups that have both of them in it. It's going to be closer to 20% because Taylor Ward is so cheap that if he's in the lineup in your outfield spot, you're much more likely to have two stud pitchers in your roster slots. So people, yeah, so then, then it's not even just Cole, right? Now, right. now it, these things just keep compounding, right? And, and it becomes so much more correlated than people even think. Like you said, and then, go back to the Tigers example. It's like, well, okay. 1% plus 1, you know, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 60%, like, oh, I'm good. Well, no, actually, every single one of those is correlated together in basically every lineup that played those. You know, and Taylor, and then um, what I was going to add on to what you are saying is this is the game to me. That Like, that's why I, I talk, you know, you do it on the pregame show. I, I try to talk every day. Um, like, I, I talk about plays to spur ideas and to kind of be like, okay, here's – some things that you should think about as opposed to just being like, oh yeah, you know, they're all just, they're all just numbers. Cause people don't always, <laughs> you know, uh, react like super well to that. I'm trying to like get the, the juices flowing, but like, this is, this is the game identifying all these things that you, that you just talked about and how, like truly how correlated these things are. People, I don't even think people can, can quite grasp it and applying it to your contest right? How you have to apply it. Like what the, everything that you just described is different than how I have to apply it because it's also not just about the stack. People want, again, people want to want to make these rules, right? Oh, I fade coal. So I do whatever I want or, Oh, I fade the chalk stack. So I do whatever I want or, Oh, you have to X out that there are no rules, right? I played what ended up being a chalk stack and I played you Darvish. It, that, that, that's not contrarian, you know, in and of itself, but I, 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 you know, analyzed the slate to find the couple of things that I needed to do. They didn't actually have anything to do with the stack. A lot of the, t- that's the easiest path usually, right? I play the fifth highest projected own stack uh, as opposed to the, the chalky stack. But again, it's not, sometimes it's, I'm not playing Garrett Cole and I am playing, I am playing the chalk stack. Sometimes it's the opposite. Sometimes it's in the middle. Sometimes it's, I'm fading all this fucking chalk. I'm play, uh, you know, like I kind of talked about that today with the not you know, not worrying about being too contrarian. Sometimes it's like the the the, the Cubs slate we talked about, right? Against Scooball, just because of the way I thought was the the cleanest path to first place was pay the super expensive. Um, it was like you talked about with Lyles, play the super expensive stack because nobody's playing it. In turn, to do that, I have to play the super cheap pitchers, and no one's playing them. I'm not too contrarian. I'm just playing a different different roster construction but that concept of figuring that out every day that is what the good players are doing now in my opinion and i probably didn't even do it very well at the start of the year it's been an evolving process um throughout this year but i think i'm starting to feel better about it right now and doing that every waking up every single day and doing that morning page morning pages Mm -hmm. is that is that what is that what it's called morning pages like and just assessing that slate, you start there and it's like this pain-free rest of the day. You have to make decisions, but it's like, once I figured out, I'm like, dude, I'm just going to bait Cole and like, I'll play freed over Kikuchi. And then it's like, I can kind of do whatever I, I, I like the white Sox. I didn't think they would be that chalky, but I'm like, the white Sox are fine, even at their ownership. And it's like, 
it's not that hard you know right. this this, this game is so it's that we're making it too hard this game it, it's not that hard it's it's incredibly simple it's hard to win <laughs> it's it's hard to get first but it's simple to make lineups that that get you to first so focusing on that specific to the contest that you that you are playing in um i think is like simpler than ever it doesn't mean it's easy it's simpler than ever but i think um you know a lot of people should like hopefully people listen to this a lot of people should probably tweak their process a little bit because the game really really has changed a lot like a lot a lot more than i can ever remember baseball changing from a dfs perspective well, now i'm not even playing vomit stacks i mean like you i i was in front most people in 2016 and 2017 before i was even at roto grinders like like oh you want like i i i've won mlb gpps or second places or something top fives mm-hmm. marlins Cheap vomit reds when they were vomit like all of yep. it has been with vomit and it's and it comes down to the fact of okay uh there's two studs on the slate and no one can play both of them right like it's just like it, it was the dynamic of uh that the whole you'd listen to shows you'd listen to con you see content and be like uh oh, beaver call beaver call beaver call beaver call <laughs> Whichever That's one the you title want. of They're the podcast. Be, right, Bieber, the title no one was talking about Bieber and Cole because, like, how are you yeah. going to do that? The only way you do that is what? You're going to play the bottom of the order Tigers or something? I mean, or are you going to play, oh, you're going to play the bottom of the order. You're going to have to play the bottom of the order Red Sox with the top of the order Pirates. And it's like, that seems nuts. And it's like, it was funny. It's, it's those, funny you the, said those are half first, the lineups I built. The first baseball live final that I, that I qualified for is doing. 100% what everyone is doing right now, similar to what you said, but you said, you mentioned the Tigers and we've talked about the Tigers probably more than Tigers fans have uh, this year so far today. But you remember when they had JD Martinez and they had Justin Upton and they had, uh, they, they were actually Castellanos was on that team. Right, they had they a bunch had of power. guys. They actually had good hitters. Yeah. They just struck they, out way too much. They, yeah. And like the, the team still wasn't all that, that, that great. They were okay. Anyway, but it was it was a Kershaw this, again. This is back in Pete Kershaw, whatever. And I'm using these shitty hitter, right? The 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 Taylor Wards of the world are my one offs. The Nick Madrigals are my one off because I'm like I'm jamming in these Tigers and I'm jamming in the the, the Aces, right? I don't know Kershaw and who the Verlander, whoever whoever it was back then. And it's like I'm in this I'm in a qualifier back then. It was like 300 people, and no, literally not one other team has this, right? You know, not 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 one. Now that that team, if I played the equivalent of that team yesterday, in a hundred man field, there's like forty of them, <laughs> yeah, like forty of of that of that team. Like the the game has completely has completely flipped flipped on its head. And I think we talked about it in in um, NFL a little bit, where people started to get kind of uh, you know galaxy brained and 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 do some of this, but nothing to this and nothing to this extent um how much i think you know not only has it changed but condensed um in in baseball me, so that, that gives you and that's even a big bigger advantage huge it is it really it, it really is in but your people contests can't, people can't wrap their heads around dude i talk you talk to people tons i talk to people tons and like they'll show up every day we have this conversation like i have this conversation with them <laughs> multiple times they show up and they're like man i love the angels today and you're just like, I mean, I guess they project, they look good. Yeah, I agree. The angels look good. They're like, I'm jamming the angels in. I'm like, we're starting, like, why, like that's, we can't start there. We can't, we can't, st- yes. You, you like Taylor Ward and Mike Trout and Shohei Otani, and you're going to play him with Garrett Cole and, and you Darvish, like, congratulations, you know, but people, so many people still can't rep, like the good players. We're not talking about the, you know, the, the really good players, but still so much of the field um, mainly talking larger field can't get their their heads wrapped around the fact that it doesn't start with like who do I like today? Well, that's the, I mean that's the whole thing. That's the whole game theory of DFS. I mean, yep. That that is that is what we talk about. And when you talk, when you 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 doing some stuff. You you tweet some stuff out occasionally. You have the you have the yep. blog, Eric Bime for on Twitter, and uh, sign up for Roto Grinders Premium for his. Uh, you would probably have to put in another update now after. Uh, Yep. I mean, nothing, I mean, no lineups. Hopefully nothing has happened. Right. 
Yesterday we had a problem with who the Padres, who knows, who knows what their lineup's going to be. Uh, sometimes you have that. And, and especially when you're playing 150 lineups on two sides, I'd rather have all the lineups because now I'm sitting going. <laughs> like, I was just glad that Marcano was out and Profar was in. It's like, okay, I could just switch Marcano with Kim and most of my, and I, I barely, yeah. I've like Marcano in like three lineups. And it's like, okay, right. like I could just do this manually, right? If it was that type of thing where we're like Machado's out and this guy's in and and it's like, okay, now 30 of my lineups I have to redo. I have to find them and then I have to rebuild them. Uh, But, uh, or like the Tatis that the, when, when Tatis got COVID, right. You know, it's like right 30 minutes before lock. Not only does that impact like, you know, your exposure, stuff like the, the slate change, like, like you know, 180 of, of the slate. So yeah, it's a whole lot easier for me with one. I can't, I, I don't have the, the mental stability to handle 300. You can find me on Twitter at Blender HD. As always, the theory of daily fantasy sports. It's a 15 hour audio DFS masterclass. I don't know why you haven't picked it up by now. It applies to any sport, MLB, NBA, NFL. It doesn't matter. Golf, MMA, that's coming up. Right, I'm gonna probably lose more money in that on Saturday. <laughs> right, I had the I had the perfect strategy, Eric. Perfect. I played lineups all like 48 to 49k. I played a hundred of them, and I missed with all of them. I didn't have the didn't happen to have the winner. Spent 48 three. Someone in Roto Grinders won in the in the chat one solo shipped 200k. But it's That's like crazy. I literally it's like okay, I'm gonna go low on this guy, low on that guy, low went low on the right guys. I made sure to just leave 1500 plus on the table. It's like, these are all going to be uniques and everything was so evenly matched up that like people are going to spend the salary for no reason. And yep. it's just, I'm looking through them. Like as long as if, if the optimal lineups under 49 K I got a ton of lineups. And I just gonna, didn't right. have that one. Just didn't <laughs> have that one. <laughs> it's horrible. It's awful. And then, and then MMA, it, that's the way it is. Like if you don't come in the top side, you lose your money. I mean, like, yep. like you can't win. Like, it's just, okay, here's a minus 40% of the day. Just even though, you know, it didn't matter what places I come in. If I'm not in the top 10, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's such whatsoever. a different, it, it's such a different conversation from like, we just talked about all, all this last couple of hours. Like, oh, well, I, I'm building teams because I don't need to be perfect. Right. You know, no, I'm build, I'm build, to be I'm, perfect. I'm, it, it's like, no, you like, you literally have to be perfect. Or not only do you not win first, you lose. <laughs> you right. Lose you lose. You can play as many lines as you want. You're going to be unprofitable. You have to it's, yeah. showdown in NFL it's is the same way. You got to have the nuts. Yep. So that's it. It's a battle yeah. for the nuts. And if <laughs> the more the see also the more the nuts is split, the more you lose not having it. Yeah. Because yeah. obviously all the places get pushed back. Get like if you come down. in. Like, like if you come in third place in MMA with a unique lineup and the first two are also unique, you'll, you'll win $25,000. I mean, you'll win 20,000 solo in third place or something like that. Right. Mm -hmm. But if first place is split 78 ways, the (laughs) second best possible scoring lineup is 79th place for like $25. Like, (laughs) Like that's the best you, if you don't have that one lineup, which is negative EV as it is. Like mm-hmm. you played a hundred lineups, you you you'd spend fifteen hundred dollars, and you get like, oh, I have a ton of lineups of cash. So here's nine hundred back. There you go. Go fuck yourself <laughs> next next Saturday, <laughs> right? Right. So I don't mind the so I don't the, when the solos and the, the less duped wins. I don't mind. It's just that I had so many of them, so many of them. Just not that. Just not that one. But uh, you could you could find out. We we talk about duplication in the in the course. Fifteen hour audio DFS masterclass. The theory of daily fantasy sports at theoryofdfs.com.